Um, so my talk today is called uh, To Run an App with Guarantees, We Must First Create the Universe. Uh, my name is Blake Irvin. I'm an engineer slash product coach at a company in Berlin called SmartBee, which is a sustainability company. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. That's my contact details. I'll post them again at the end. Um, I was hoping to be able to do more hallway track stuff today, but I have a sick dog at home, so I have to do my talk and like run home and take care of my dog. Hopefully my flat's not destroyed. Um, yeah, so I work for this company called SmartBee. We make um, a, various uh, like software tools that do, we do data analysis and we, we focus really on tools for large enterprises and industrial sites uh, focusing on specifically on transparency, efficiency, and sustainability. Um, so our, like, our strategic goal or our, our, our ethical DNA as a company is reducing human impact on the planet. Here's an example of one of the tools that we make. Um, so you can kind of see here we've got some like general consumption information and savings and, and how many uh, kilograms of CO2 we're saving by doing certain actions. And we're basically trying to give people sort of like a feedback loop to help them consume less. And we are hiring. So if this is the kind of work that you think is interesting or are, are curious about, um, please talk to me uh, either directly or you know, via email or something later. Um, what I'm specifically talking about today is things that we do at SmartB with a tool called Habitat. Um, if there's some, any Kinvolk people in the room, I think Kinvolk is collaborating with the Habitat folks on a, a Kubernetes support for Habitat. Habitat is like an application lifecycle management tool. It's very difficult to explain Habitat in one sentence, but that was my, that was my best effort. Um, and that's also something I'd love to talk more about later if anybody's curious about how Habitat works in more detail or hasn't tried it. Um, I don't think there's a user group for Habitat in Berlin yet, but I would love to be part of that if there were a few people that, that wanted to do it. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's, but it's not specifically a Habitat talk. It's, there are, we're gonna talk specifically about some things we had to do in Habitat, but I'm thinking more about like big picture stuff in general. Um, yeah, so anyway, the name of the talk is to run an app with guarantees we must first create the universe. And I think a fair question at this point is what, what, why am I saying that? Like, why is it necessary to create the universe? Um, and the answer is because we have to. Anything that happens requires the universe to exist. Um, I'm stealing, uh, 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 or I'm paraphrasing Carl Sagan when he said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So on the left, we have the Big Bang, and then everything else that happens, all biological evolution, and then the apple pie at the end. And since it's uh, the autumn, it's, we, we can contemplate apple pie for a moment, um, which I'm looking forward to eating lots of, especially if I get to go home to the States for Thanksgiving. Um, yes, but anyway, I'm talking about this sort of like idea of a pocket universe for the application, like not the universe itself, but the universe from the point of view of the app. Um, and so when I say universe, I don't obviously mean a real universe. What I mean is the application, all, this, all the code I need to run the app, plus all the dependencies the app has. And I'm talking about pocket universes because I don't want interactions between these different applications. I want to define what those are and control them. Um, another way to think about this would be in like biological terms, because what's a little bit different about habitat versus uh, things like, I don't know, uh, like a BSD jail or a Solaris zone or a container is that it's also explicitly defining the entire application lifecycle. So here, this is a beehive. In like this uh, little cell number one, we have a, a, an egg, right? Uh, and then in two, we have a slightly older larva and a much older larva in three. And then four, we have a pupa. So now it's about to transform into a bee. And what's going to hatch out of that is a bee. That's the whole life cycle. That whole, not the whole life cycle, but it's the entire like, juvenile section of the life cycle. And that's all happening inside in, in isolation from the rest. Um, and that's important because we want isolation. But one of the questions that a lot of folks that I work with at SmartBee asked when I started pushing this idea of like heavily isolated applications is why does this matter? Um, and for me, as a, a sort of like a life or, or career long operations engineer, it's a, a lot of this is about safety, right? So if you, I remember lots and lots of times uh, early in my 
uh, well, it wasn't really my career, but before my career when I was working, or when I was using thing, horrible things like Windows 95 at home to play games, I would install a game. If there was a problem with the game, I had to reinstall like the entire rest of the operating system because there was some kind of like splash damage happening. That was not safe, right? That's, splash damage is bad. Like we don't want, we, just because we make a change to one thing, uh, one part of the stack that we're running, we don't want, we don't want bad effects to spill over into other, um, other components. Um, and that, that I, I don't know if anybody else has had experiences like that, but I certainly have. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about why safety matters for another reason, um, which, we'll, which I'll get to in a bit here. Um, there's also like the problem of entanglement. Um, does anybody, can anybody tell me what film this is from? This should be easy for this crowd, right? I can't hear. Yeah, right. So this is, I think this is the first Lord of the Rings movie. Um, and the dwarf Gimli is about to fall off a cliff into some hole or something. And one of his buddies grabs him by the beard. And the reason that this is a dramatic moment, besides being funny, um, the reason it's dramatic is because you don't know if the beard, which is like the connection between the two people, is going to save this one guy or kill both of them. Right, because if he falls too far, he's going to pull the other guy with him, and then they're both going to die. And that's the kind of entanglement that can happen between uh, services or applications that run, uh, let's say, on the same system, especially. Um, and, that, and so we want to really control exactly how those connections look, right? Because we don't want to, we don't want, we want it to, we don't want to be in a situation where one service going down pulls the other service with it. Um, so we, in general, what we're trying to do, uh, or one of the things we're trying to do is avoid cascading failures. Um, this is another good example from uh, biology. If you've, has anybody ever built like a self-contained terrarium before? So these are like sealed, right? Like there's no air coming in or out. You have enough microorganisms and like animalia in here to generate carbon dioxide, or yeah, carbon dioxide, which the plant will then turn into oxygen and you have this cycle. Um, if I have three of these and I mess up the system here, the other two should survive, right? So that's another example of like isolation being a good thing for us. Or we can go back to thinking about like the beehive example, right? Like one of, um, I'm not sure offhand whether there are wasps that parasitize honeybees, but almost every insect on earth has some kind of parasitic wasp that preys on it. And the parasitic wasp will come and lay an egg on the egg of the thing that's parasitizing and its larva hatches and eats the bigger animal's larva. If that happens here, let's say like I'm a wasp and I come and land here and my baby starts parasitizing that larva, all the rest should be okay in theory um, because everything's separated and isolated. But the more important thing for us at SmartBee is uh, our emphasis on scaling down. Um, and some of the safety stuff applies to this as well as we'll see in a minute. Um, Scaling down matters to us because the entire point of the company, like the reason SmartBee exists, is because we are trying to get humanity as a species to scale down. Uh, most of human history, especially since the Industrial Revolution, has been all about growth. And now we're kind of like pushing the envelope for resources, and we're starting to see places where we just don't have any more stuff to use, right? So we need to scale down and start reusing those resources or avoid using resources that uh, we don't need to. And that also applies for technical operations. Um, I don't remember exact numbers, but you can definitely see some really interesting studies about the amount of energy that's going to be consumed by data center operations over the next like 10 to 20 years. And it's not super cool if we continue powering these data centers with like fossil fuels, for example. Um, so ideally what we want to do then is we want to we want to do workload consolidation. Like we want to get as much stuff to happen on a single compute resource as possible so that we don't have any unused resources that we're still like emitting carbon. Um, but that is traditionally a little bit scary, right? Because we have like safety concerns if we're doing, if we're, if we're doing, um, if I was doing this in the 90s and somebody told me, put every single one of your services on the same box, I would be like, there's no way I'm doing that. I'm absolutely not doing that. That's crazy. I can't guarantee that my database and my application server can run on the same system safely because they have too many possible interconnections. And then I won't be able to do like an app to get update, for example, because if I update OpenSSL and I have one version of OpenSSL for the database and I need a different version for my application server and I do both of those things, or I, I do that one update, I could break one of those two critical services. Um, 
but complete I isolation makes things uh, much safer, so we can put a lot of muscle in a very small space. Um, these are, I'm not sure if they're necessarily racehorses, but uh, I go horseback riding every moment or every uh, opportunity I get. Um, and one of the things that you realize when you're close to a horse is that they're a very big animal. Like they weigh around a thousand kilos, I think, up, or somewhere in that range. Um, if one of them falls down on you, it will either paralyze or kill you. Um, so you really, like safety is a big issue when you're working with horses. Um, and horses can also hurt themselves and other horses very easily just because they're so big. Um, but when people transport them, they want like a safe mechanism for getting all of this valuable muscle from one place to another and building these ex extremely strong, isolated sort of like containers basically for the horses, that, that's a way of getting all of that valuable muscle from one place to another without uh, wasting a lot of resources. So instead of having like one truck per horse, which would be the easy way to do things, which is basically what we did with compute in the 90s and kind of even still do it today, to be honest. Um, uh, the alternative to that is to build this strong isolation so that we can pack a lot of resources onto, or a lot of uh, compute or work onto one uh, set of resources. And this is, this is kind of, this is like the classic, like I, I would say for half of my career, which is now 15 years or so, this is what I thought was a good, uh, this is the way that I thought the world should look for the services I was running. That everything was like perfectly clean and nice and there was lots of overhead, lots of, you know, like, like breathing room at the top and nothing was overutilized and everything was fairly cold, like literally cold, or I would just say that figuratively that my, my systems were like cool and not running too hot. But that's not actually what we want. Um, what we want is something more like this, right? This is the famous, this is fine dog. Um, but actually, this is fine. Like, if everything's almost on fire, like all my systems are running at like 98% capacity, that's actually great, because that means I'm not spending any carbon on anything that is not being used, right? That's actually what we want. We want every, um, one of the big problems that we have with transportation in the United States is that if you go to work in the morning in the Bay Area, where I, that's where I lived before uh, I worked in Berlin, I would commute to work on my motorcycle, and I would, and also in California, you're, you're allowed to lane split, which means you can drive in between two, rows of, two lanes of cars on the highway. So I'd be going like 120 in between these other cars, and I would pass car, 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 car on both sides of me, and every single car had a single passenger, right? So they're all burning fossil fuels, um, but there's only, they're only operating at like 25% capacity. That's bad. But what we want is every car to be completely full, right? These people, um, probably for economic reasons, are much better at utilizing the resource than most of us are. Um, and this is something that I'm, we're trying to fix at SmartBee for ourselves too, like the way we run, we run services. Um, that looks a little bit, this, this might actually be not ideal optimization, right? <laughs> like there's a, good, there's, a good chance, there's a good chance that this truck is not, at, it is not, uh, operating at the best load to carbon ratio, carbon output ratio. But that's something that we can figure out, right? We're smart people, we know how to measure stuff. We can figure out ways to say, I wanna put as much stuff as I can on this resource without increasing my carbon footprint in a bad way. And this is, this is, the, this is the, the picture that I look to, like to look at when I think about this stuff. This is the uh, NASA photograph AS08-14-2383, which was taken from the Apollo 8 spacecraft in the 60s, I guess. And this is, I think, the first time in history that a human held a camera and took a picture of the place that all of the rest of human history had happened. Right? So that's like everything that ever happened is right there, more or less. Um, the, everything that we care about, everything having to do with human life, and that that was, I think, the beginning of our realization as a species that the, we are really in a very small container. Like, we're in a very small, limited set of resources, and we need to protect those or things are going to get super weird. And that is why I, th I really think that the future is scaled down, not up. Um, at the moment, we're still very much sort of addicted to this, uh, the, the sort of high you get from working on these, like, all of, all of this uh, tech stuff that's very focused on growth and speed and performance. Um, although, technically speaking, performance systems can also be very small, but we can talk about that more later. 
Um, anyway, yeah, so this is why I think that the future is scaled down. But there's a problem with this, um, that there are downsides to doing this kind of isolation. And this is the, this is the sort of the nitty gritty technical details I wanted to touch on very quickly today. For s some of the places where we've had pain trying to keep things really small and isolated, um, and how we tried to solve those. So one of the biggest problems is that if you want to prove that you can run in isolation, you have to start from zero every time. Um, Habitat as a tool, which is the tool we use for doing this, other folks might use Docker, you can use Habitat and Docker together actually. Um, Habitat as a tool assumes that you always have to start from zero to prove that you really have isolation, which means that if we are also, say, depending on something upstream, like we do a lot of Python stuff, that means we, use, we do a lot of pip installs, PyPy is pretty much guaranteeing the contents of the packages that we install, right? So they're doing this for us. It would be stupid if I was getting these supplies for me to unpack and repack every box that drops out of the airplane, right? This is me doing pip install, basically, um, during our builds. Uh, yeah, so that, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's actually what we're doing whenever we do a build in like a habitat build. When we build our artifacts, we do a pip install of all the dependencies that we need, and then out of the, uh, that, which literally means that we're downloading everything, unpacking everything, and then compressing it again. But it was already compressed in checksum, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Um, and it, it intellectually is annoying, but the real like tangible pain of it is that it just makes builds very slow. So we have a very, one of our applications is a very big Python monolith that does a lot of scientific computing. It's about half a gig after it's installed on disk. Waiting for half a gig of, of files to be compressed is a long build. Like it's, it's a, it's, and it's like 300,000 files or something. Um, so one of the ways that we chose to fix that was by vendoring, right? So if, if, you, if you've used um, uh, like a package manager for any of the common distributions, you've probably used a vendor uh, thing before. Like a really common one that I used to use on Ubuntu systems back in the day was I think the apt version, or the apt, apt uh, vendored uh, image magic, because image magic is super hard to build, but I needed it for a lot of my apps. Um, it's also full of security holes. Um, but this, so for us though, that's not really what, we're, what we care about so much. We don't do much with image magic, but we do do a lot of machine learning stuff which means we use TensorFlow. Um, and TensorFlow is about, or this version of TensorFlow is about 150 megabytes compressed. So when you uncompress it, it's like 300 or something. It's a huge, huge, huge package. So uncompressing and then recompressing that when we don't need to is something that, we, that was kind of like a, a wasteful part of the cycle we wanted to fix. And we fixed it by doing some tricks to actually unwrap it in the Habitat Builder service, which is part of the application lifecycle, and then store the thing uh, that we had sort of pulled out of PyPy or pulled out of the pip module, store that as a vendored um, package, um, which, but a Habitat package, so that now we can depend on it as a Habitat thing, and we don't have to do, go through the dependency song and dance twice. So this is like, co I have mixed feelings about showing actual code in a, uh, in talks like this, because I don't think that you can learn much from it. But I, I can share this to anybody who's interested directly if you contact me later uh, via the internets. Um, but basically what we're doing here is we have uh, a variable called package version, or it's, it's actually a function, but we're treating it also as a variable. It's part of the build plan. We get, we look at our requirements.txt, which is part of the pip install uh, ecosystem for the main application that we build. Um, and then we, uh, we get the version and then we update that. Um, we do, uh, and then the, the main, the, the big trick that we do here, and you, depending on what dependency manager you have, this may or may, you, you may or may not be able to use um, this trick. We use a feature of Habitat that allows us to push an environment variable in from a thing you depend on into the thing that depends on it. Um, and that allows us to construct like a new Python path with all of the dependencies um, that we've vendored. Um, and that's how we do, that's how we tell Builder what we care, or what, to, what should trigger a new build of the vendored module. And here we're depending on it. This is very ugly code, but very readable, which is a good thing for ops, because you usually don't look at this stuff for months or years. Um, so you really want it to be readable, not elegant. And then the last thing that we do is local caching. Um, and for that, we use similar uh, tricks. This is a physical, like a, like a food cache, basically. Um, we don't want to, if we had one, if you had, 
like a, an emergency cache like this, you wouldn't want to restock it every time you used it. You would leave as much as you could behind between uses. And that's what we've been trying to do, because caching really just means reuse. Um, and so we, I wrote a very, very small package that uses the same trick about pushing environment variables to uh, push uh, or to configure your different, uh, like NPM or Go or PIP, uh, or the PIP build environment to store the things that those dependency managers cache in the loopback mounted caching location that's part of Habitat anyway. Um, this could certainly be improved. Um, we could also talk about, like, or I've been thinking already about additionally pushing the cache to like S3 or some object store somewhere else. But this basically means that if we do this, if this is my dependencies for my build, um, if I depend on Vishu cacher, cacher uh, that's going to automatically, at least for local builds, like local development work, it's going to put all the stuff that I want to cache into a permanent location instead of an ephemeral one, because every time I do the build, Habitat's going to tear everything down and start from zero. But this, the stuff that we're caching, will avoid that. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll put my contact information up there again, because I think the time is short. Um, and that's it. Python packages. Oh. Yeah, so you're talking about um, vendoring for Python packages. Is that the kind of primary solution you use for for um, supporting Python dependencies? Um, or do you use like uh, like wheel builds or anything like that? Yeah, so well, if, if, we were using, if we were doing wheels that we kind of were in the same situation, right? Like the wheel is kind of like a guaranteed thing. And then if we have to download the wheel from somewhere, even if it's our own thing, it's just, it's just doubling the work. Like, because we already have a mechanism for taking some bits, putting them into an archive, which is, in this case, a Habitat archive is like the lowest level, lowest common denominator, which has a checksum and guarantees. So we just, we did try the wheels thing for a while, but we didn't see huge performance wins by doing that because we still had to go through the unzip, expand, compress, repack it, like this whole, this whole cycle again. Um, also, because uh, no, I think that was pretty much it. Yeah, that was that. It was ma mainly just um, a speed of light problem, like just going to the internet and doing all these TLS handshakes every time we grab a new module just turned out to be really slow. And so, the more we can avoid that, the the better it is. And in Python's case, it's especially difficult when you're using like scientific computing stuff, because like TensorFlow is huge, Cython is huge. SciPy is huge. These are like massive modules. Um, I think in the case of like NPM, where you have like like absolutely insane number of modules, you'd probably have more trouble not on the compression and uncompression side, but the um, the TLS side, just the network transfer. We have one minute left for questions. You can definitely ask me stuff online later. I'll I'll do my best to respond as quickly as I can. So. <laughs> Test. Okay. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. So when you say uh, vendoring, is that like checked into your source repository? Is that how you use Habitat? No, or no, like no. Actually, what happens is so so the build service in Habitat is looking at our repository, um, and that stuff that I kind of had to skim over real quickly. That Toml definition. It's it's builders looking every time there's a Git push, um, it looks at the master branch, sees if any of those things that match that those globbing expressions have changed. And then if they do, then it goes through the process of actually looking at the requirements file, figuring out what the version of the module is, and then building a vendored module, and then pushing the vendored thing back into the, uh, the, the builder repository. It's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, that's kind of, that's why I decided to put my contact stuff back up on the screen, because there's a lot of like little details that are not clear and that I couldn't explain efficiently in 30 minutes. So I'm happy to talk about it later online or something. Anything else? All right, I think that's it then, thanks.